Hello, and welcome to the latest of the Kavli Foundation's Spotlight Live webcasts, which offer a chance to hear from scientists on the cutting edge of discovery. Today, we're going to the dark side. This month, three next generation experiments are taking significant steps in the hunt for dark matter, that elusive substance that appears to make up more than a quarter of the universe, but is fundamentally different from the matter we see around us every day. The experiments learned in July that each would receive funding from the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. Now they're preparing for their hunt, but it's not going to be an easy quest. That's especially true because scientists are still unsure what dark matter is made of. There are many theoretical options, and none of them is easy to test for because dark matter particles interact very rarely with the type of matter that makes up our world. My name is Callan Tuttle, and I'll be moderating today's hang Hangout. Before we begin, however, I'd like to let you know about a Spotlight Live coming up next week about the science of the blockbuster film Interstellar. We sent three Cavalier Institute astrophysicists into the darkness of their neighborhood theaters. They returned, and next Wednesday, November 26th, from 12 to 12.30 Pacific, they'll separate interstellar science from its fiction. If you'd like to find out more about that, please visit the Cavalier Foundation's website or follow us on Twitter. Today, though, we're diving into dark matter. We have with us experimentalists who work on all three of the newly funded dark matter experiments. They're building some of the most advanced detectors ever conceived to hunt for dark matter particles. Tali Figueroa Feliciano is a physicist with the MIT Cavalier Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research who hunts dark matter and will take part in one of the recently funded experiments. Harry Nelson is a physicist at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's also the science lead for another of the new dark matter experiments. And Gray Ribka is a physicist at the University of Washington. He leads the third recently funded experiment, which looks for a completely different type of dark matter than Tali and Harry's experiments. By the way, before we begin, let me remind you, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please send it to the Kavli Foundation by email at info at kavlifoundation.org or via Twitter using the hashtag Kavli Live. So I'd like to start with a very basic, yet far from simple question. One of our viewers has asked how we know for sure that dark matter even exists. Tali, I'm hoping that maybe you can start us off. You know, how do you know that there's something out there for you to find? Sure. So the, the primary reason that we think that we know that dark matter is out there is through uh, astronomical observations. So we, uh, uh, in, in the 1930s, the first hints of this came out by looking at the velocities of galaxy uh, clusters and all of the uh, motions in there. Um, one way that I could explain it is if you imagine having a rock um, and tying a string around it and you're twirling it around, the faster you twirl the rock on the string, the more force you have to do with your hand, the higher the tension on that string. And when people uh, looked at the velocity rotations of galaxies, they noticed that um, the stars were moving way too fast to be explained from the uh, force that we would see due to gravity from the mass that we knew was there from our observations. And the implication of that was that if the stars are moving faster, then they're getting tugged with more force. And that gravitational force comes from mass. And so the, uh, the assumption is that then there's some more matter than what we can count in, some matter that is dark that we can't see, um, that is allowing those stars to stay in the galaxy with that fast rotational speed. Now, there are many different types of observations that have been done uh, at the very largest scales with the cosmic microwave background, at the uh, um, scales of clusters of galaxies, at the scales of galaxies that I was just talking about. And then even when we look at particle physics, uh, we know that there uh, are things about the, part, the, the standard model of particle physics that aren't quite right. And we're trying to find out what the, those next steps are. And that's part of what's being done at the LHC and those collider experiments. And some of those theories predict particles that very naturally would be candidates for dark matter. And so from the largest cosmic scales to the smallest particle physics scales, there are reasons to believe that dark matter is there and there are candidates for what that dark matter can be. 
So Harry, I'm hoping that you can follow up on that a little bit. Um, so sure. your experiment, as well as the one that Tali works on, they both look for one of the most promising of these theoretical particles. Um, in fact, you know, there, there are more than 30 dark matter experiments that are currently planned or underway, and the great majority of them search for this very type of particle. Um, right. It's one that interacts so weakly with the matter in our world that it's called the WIMP. That's so I'm hoping, I'm hoping Harry, you can tell us why all of these experiments focus on this one type of particle. Well, that's a, I'll get there. I want to emphasize that WIMP is an acronym, actually. It is W-I-M-P, and that stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. And massive particle means a mass that's, oh, you know, uh, a little smaller than the mass of a proton up to many times the mass of a proton. So that's the massive particle. And the, the evidence for that, well, the evidence for why a WIMP is, is so popular is that it's uh, interactions in, well, it, it's easy to fit into descriptions of the Big Bang. Maybe the easiest to, to fit in the interactions of the Big Bang. And the concept is, is thermal equilibrium, at least initially, that, you know, I was thinking of how to explain thermal equilibrium. All it is is when you put something in the refrigerator, it, it ends up at the same temperature that the refrigerator was at. I, I was thinking I had a leftover sandwich last night from when I went out to dinner, and I put it in my refrigerator. Now it's all cold. So in the early universe, the concept is the dark matter was in thermal equilibrium with our matter. The thing that gets a little more complicated is the, after the Big Bang, the, university gradu or the universe gradually cools down, and they fall out of equilibrium. And what happens, at least in this idea, which you know, is a conjecture, of course, but a popular conjecture, is that the dark matter gradually can keep finding itself and annihilating and turning into our matter but the reverse process can no longer go on because our matter doesn't have enough energy. And this is, the, why does the dark matter have enough energy? Well, there's energy in its mass. So that concept then says, well, to explain the current abundance of dark matter, the interaction between dark matter and us numerically is about the same as the weak interaction, and that's the WI of weakly interacting. Um, and weakly interacting implies a numerical strength that is consistent with, you know, beta decay in radioactivity or, for example, the production of the Higgs particle at the LHC. So that the weak interaction seemed to appear from this idea about the Big Bang appeals to people. Doesn't prove it, but sort of Occam's razor makes it seem attractive. Occam's razor being, you know, don't make anything more complicated than you have to. Now, there are other reasons, though, why the WIMP is, is there are at least two other main reasons why the WIMP is so popular. One of them is that if this whole idea is right, there are at least two other ways to detect the WIMP. One is at the LHC, as we've, as we've discussed, okay, as Tali mentioned. And another one is these WIMP annihilations where the WIMPs find each other and turn into our matter may be going on as we speak. That is, in certain places in the universe, like in the center of stars or the center of our galaxy, that same process may be going on. So if, if we get lucky, if this is really right, which, you know, it may not, but we're always doing our best, we could hit a trifecta. We could see the same particle in our WIMP experiments, like mine, Lux LZ, or Tali's uh, Super CDMS. We could see it there. We could see it at the LHC, maybe. And we could also see it astrophysically, and that would be the trifecta. Of course, there's a, there's a second reason why so many people are building these WIMP experiments is that We've, we've made a lot of progress in how to build them, so we can build them. And uh, people have had lots of ideas, and there's been a lot of create creativity with many techniques to look for these things. And it, I'll, I'll say, partly that's true because it, they're a little easier to look for than the Axion, where you need really talented people and expert people like Gray and Leslie Rosenberg. So I think that's a nice segue into Gray's experiment. Gray, you, you don't look for the WIMP. You look for something called the Axion. Um, this is a very lightweight particle. It has no electric charge, no spin. It also interacts with our world very rarely. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experiment and why you look for the axion? Well, I, I look for the axion instead of WIMPs because if I looked for WIMPs, then I would have to compete with very smart people like Harry and Tolly, and that's really intimidating. <laughs> but um, there's, there's other really good reasons. So the axion is uh, a good dark matter candidate. It's very, very light. It... Uh, Comes from comes from a solution actually to a, a something we don't quite understand about how uh, physics works inside nuclei, uh, and 
it's different than the WIMP in that it's extremely light, and you look look for it through coupling to photons or uh, say radio frequency kind of energy. And certainly, I got I got involved in this because I, I I was looking at dark matter and saw there's a lot of people looking for WIMPs, not me not many people looking for axions. It's difficult to look for, but there had been some technical break, breakthroughs uh, involving basically that everyone has cell phones now, and so a lot of a lot of work has been done at these uh, these these sort of the right frequencies to be looking for axions, and everyone's looking for to make a quantum computer, and so there's a lot of low temperature really nice RF amplification that, that allow us to build the, the experiments. So the time is right to be looking for axions and building experiments for them. So there are, besides the WIMPs and the axion, there's actually a lot of other theorized particles out there. Um, and one of our viewers wrote in and would like to know how likely it is that dark matter is, in fact, neither of the uh, particles that your experiments look for, but rather composed of super heavy particles called WIMPzillas. Um, the viewer is also wondering if there's a way to test whether the Wimpzilla hypothesis is correct. Yeah. Well, I could start off, and maybe you guys could jump in. I mean, the Wimpzilla is, it's got Wimp in its name, so it's still weakly interacting. And Zilla is, it's just uh, as massive as Godzilla. So that's super massive, okay? And then the way it works is all our measurements astrophysically tell us how much mass there is per unit volume. They don't tell us, uh, they, they tell us, let's say, the cumulative total mass per unit volume uh, of dark matter, but whether you apportion that mass in a great many light particles or just a few really heavy particles, we, we can't tell from astrophysical data. So it could be that the dark matter consists of just a few super duper heavy things. And to detect something like a Wimpzilla, okay, there wouldn't be very many to see. So you'd have to build a gigantic detector. And there what we run into is uh, nobody wants to give us billions of dollars because that's just too much money. Okay, so that's what keeps us from, I think, making progress on the idea of the Wimpzilla. Yeah, I think the, the general uh, point is that there are many theories that are possible of what dark matter could be. And um, we have to do a combination of what we can look for with the experiments we can build and what theory and our current understanding give us a clue of where the best places to look are. Now, not all of the, par of the theories out there have as good a foundation as others. Some uh, would work, but uh, have different types of assumptions built into them. And so we need to make a value judgment as experimentalists. We do not know what we're looking for. And we have this menu of options. And so we kind of choose, well, what are the, the, the best courses on the menu and which of those I can afford and which of those are going to be easy for my experiments to see. And that uh, convolution of things is what, what sort of prompts us to look for particular candidates, at least first. And maybe if we don't find them here, we will look for them elsewhere, and of course, there's no reason what dark matter has to be one thing, and it might be composed of several things, and so we might find uh, uh, wimps and and axions and other things we don't know yet. So one more of those options that one of our viewers is interested in hearing about. So this viewer points to a press release that was issued last week by Case Western University, and this press release describes a theory in which dark matter is actually made up of macroscopic objects, so none of the particles that you guys are, are hunting for. Um, and this viewer would like to know whether there's any reason why dark matter would be more likely to be made up of the individual, <coughs> excuse me, the individual exotic particles that you look for than it is to be made up of macroscopic particles. Well, Gray, do you want to lead off? Or? Well, I'm not actually familiar with this press release, press release, so if you've read it, maybe you better go ahead. I, I did read it, and this is, uh, you know, first of all, papers like that are one of the reasons this field is so exciting. There's just so many different ideas out there, and uh, there's, you know, like a big discussion going on all the time of new ideas come, and we discuss them and think about them, and sometimes, sometimes the, the new idea gets pointed out there was an earlier work or earlier paper at inconsistency. Other times people say, wow, we have no idea. That could be great. So this concept that the dark matter might consist of, of particles that coalesce into, let's call them solid objects or massive objects, that idea has been around for a long time. And in fact, there was a search you know, 20 or so years ago, one of the pioneering searches for stuff like that, where they looked for large 
objects at loose in our galaxy to, to create gravitational lensing. So you'd look at stars out in our galaxy, and if they suddenly became brighter, that was evidence of all things of a massive object moving in front of them. And you might think, how can an object move in front of something and give it more light? That's the mystery of gravitational lensing. That's what gravitational lensing does. So this idea has been out there. The, this paper, it looked to me, was a very careful reanalysis of where there might be gaps where there you could you could have uh, massive objects constitute the dark matter. And they were very carefully went through all the ways that you could evade um, you know, other problems. For example, there's a idea that's been around for a long time that maybe there's a different kind of nuclear matter out there. Our nuclear matter is made of up and down quarks, and maybe there's a form of nuclear matter that involves the strange quark. And people have been searching for that for 30 or 40 years, but, but that's a, it's just one of those things. The jury's still out. We've never been able to find it, but maybe it exists and maybe it's the dark matter. But I would say, you know, in some estimate of probabilities, I would say it's less likely, but we could be wrong. And what's great is to have the scientific discussion always going because the probabilities get reassessed all the time. And well, these, uh, these massive objects had a very amusing uh, uh, acronym. Is they, they were massive, massive compact halo objects, machos. So for a while, it was machos right. versus wimps, which I found very amusing to. to oh read. yeah, <laughs> that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, very good. And w one thing that uh, I would add is that um, it this paper and, and this whole uh, idea of of the the variety of models. Uh, really highlights how diverse the possibilities for looking for dark matter are. In that paper, they were citing, um, you know, people that looked into mica uh, samples that had been buried for, you know, uh, many, 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 many years, and they looked for tracks in these things. And so, when you start looking for a particular theory, the the the, the theoretical community, or you have a candidate, the theoretical community starts scanning every possibility of a signal that might have been left, not just in our detectors, but in the atmosphere, in meteorites, in stars, in uh, the, the structure uh, that we see in the universe. So there are other detectors out there that are more indirect than ours that are specifically uh, designed for looking for dark matter, but that's one of the things that makes it exciting is that maybe we find it in our detectors and we might find traces of it in other things that we haven't even thought about. So, related to this, I mean, in the history of particle physics, there have been a number of particles that we knew existed, you know, long before we were able to detect them. And in a lot of cases, we knew a lot of a lot about these particles' characteristics before we found them. And this seems so very different from that, where, um, you know, we've got lots of ideas about what a dark matter particle's characteristic, characteristics could be, um, but, you know, nothing like we knew for, say, the Higgs boson or the top quark before we found them. Why is that? What is fundamentally different here? I, I would guess that it, uh, it involves, so we know about uh, dark matter from gravitational interactions, and we have a hard time fitting gravity in with these fundamental particles to begin with. Would you all agree? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, th there, is, there are some analogs, and you have to go back in time quite a, quite a bit. I mean, one of the famous analogs is the, the discovery of the neutron where the, the proton was discovered in a fantastic set of experiments during World War I by Rutherford. But he, he had a good intuition and thought there should be another particle that's like the proton that is neutral, which they called the neutron. And it took, even though they had a pretty good idea what it should be like, it took 12 or 15 years for them to detect one because it was just difficult. And uh, when it was finally detected, there was a, an experiment done by the Curies, by you know, the famous Marie Curie and her group in, in France, and they interpreted something in a very strange way that no one really, in retrospect, it looks like you'd never make the interpretation the Curies made. And uh, a guy named Chadwick, I think it's James Chadwick, looked at their data and said, my God, that's it. And so he then repeated an experiment, and he did it his way and proved it was the neutron. But I've often, that story is so important because the neutron is the key to all uses of nuclear energy, it turns out, or most uses, anyway, of nuclear energy. And it's, it's a very interesting story for that 
that reason that, that I suspect with dark matter we'll have some sort of rerun of that where we're all looking and some somewhere even maybe now there's a little bit of data that someone will have an aha moment. Yeah, and I also think that the uh, when you look at the uh, particles that were looked in uh, the Tevatron and in the LHC, uh, we already had this nice framework uh, of the standard model, and right now we don't really have a a uh, uh, the one single theory of what should come after. Now, of course, the most popular one is supersymmetry, and that's the thing that the LHC is trying to find. But it's not at all clear that that is the solution of what lies beyond the standard model. And that uh, ambiguity leads to the plethora of dark matter models, because dark matter lies outside of this framework of the standard model. And we don't know in which direction this model will grow or how it will change. And so uh, people look at all the possibilities, and many of those have good dark matter candidates. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, that we don't know what that there's so many different options. We we we're at this uh, there's this chasm uh, between where we are now when where the the, the light of, of of understanding is, and we don't know which direction to go in. And so people are looking at all possible directions, and that just generates lots of great ideas. And it seems like your experiments are hopefully going to direct one way or another. It, you know, if and when we finally see some evidence of dark matter, it'll help us, you know, incrementally learn a little bit more. Um, along those lines, one of our viewers would like to know how you go about detecting dark matter in your experiments. If this is a type of matter that really doesn't interact with us very much, you know, how do you make dark matter interact with regular matter? Gray, why don't you take that? Okay, so well, I'll, I'll start on mine and then go to yours. We use very, very different techniques. So yeah, for axions, right. the, uh, the axions can, every once in a while, uh, couple to photons, so just regular light, and they, they do so in a way that the, the photons produced are of microwave frequencies, just quite literally the, the frequency used by your cell phone or in your, your microwave oven. And so the way we look for them is look for this very occasional... Uh, sort of transmutation of, of an axion from the dark matter around us into a, a microwave photon. And we do that, we can, we can sort of help this process along using a strong magnetic field and using a, a cavity that's resonant just to the, the, the axions, the, the frequency of the photon coming from the axion. And it ends up being a, a, a scanning experiment where it's, it's an AM radio, you know there's a signal out there at a certain frequency, but you don't know what the frequency is and you're tuning around listening to hear, oh, is there a little extra power here that's coming from dark matter turning into photons? And so that's how I look for dark matter. And I'll pass it to, to you all. And you, you each, ha each of us has a different answer. Right. OK, let, let me, um, I guess let me jump in here then. So um, Harry and I are looking for similar uh, particles called uh, WIMPs. Um, and um, my experiment is particularly good at looking for WIMPs that are at about the mass of the proton or a couple of times uh, heavier. And, um, and Harry's experiment will, uh, is uh, better at looking for uh, particles that are maybe a hundred to several hundred times uh, heavier than the proton. But the idea is the same. If you kind of, uh, as Harry was mentioning before, we know sort of the density of dark matter particles in our region of space and the, in the galaxy around the sun, around the Earth. So you can calculate how many of these dark matter particles going through me, through you, through your room right now. And if you stick out your hand and you assume something in the order of uh, 60 times the proton mass, you just pick a number, you'll get something about that, that tells you that there's about 20 million dark matter particles, if dark matter are WIMPs, going through your hand every second. Now, these dark matter particles go through your hands, they go through the Earth, they go out the other side of the Earth. But maybe, perhaps, they very rarely interact with one of the atoms uh, in... In, in the matter on the Earth. And so we uh, both um, build detectors that hope to catch some of those very, very rare interactions. Uh, the way that my experiment works is by having a crystal uh, made out of some element, in our case germanium or silicon, and we cool this crystal down uh, to uh, millikelvin temperatures, so almost at absolute zero. If you guys uh, remember your, your high school uh, physics, when atoms get very, very cold, they stop vibrating. And so this crystal, the atoms are not vibrating much at all, 
And if you come in with a dark matter particle and it actually does interact with one of the atoms in the crystal and wax into it, the whole crystal starts vibrating. And those vibrations uh, are sensed by little microphones that uh, we call phonon sensors uh, on the surfaces of our detectors. They also release charge and we measure the charge uh, on, that is released. And both of those are actually help us to determine not only the energy that was imparted to the target, but what type of interaction it was. Was it uh, an interaction like the one you, you would expect from a photon or an electron, or an interaction from what you would expect from a WIMP or perhaps a neutron? And that helps us to distinguish and take out backgrounds uh, that are very, very dominant because uh, the radioactivity in our, in, 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 in our environment is very high. And so we have to spend a lot of effort to try to lower the background sources by shielding in active discrimination uh, to be able to be sensitive to these uh, very elusive signals. In fact, you even go to the extent of working far underground, is that right? Yes. You bet. And I'll, I'll let Harry take it from here. Yeah. Well, the two mines that our experiments are going to be in, they're different. Uh, ours is about a mile underground in uh, western South Dakota in the Black Hills, the Great Black Hills. Like in the song Rocky Raccoon by the Beatles, they mention the Black Mining Hills of Dakota. So, uh, and Tali is up in uh, uh, Ontario, I believe, in uh, Sudbury, where there's a wonderful metals mine. One analogy I wanted to, to bring up for people is it's all billiards. What Tali and I do is a, is a microscopic version of billiards, where our targets, in my case xenon, and in his case germanium and also silicon, uh, are like the, the colored balls in a pool on a pool table, okay? And then what we're trying to detect is the cue ball, except the cue ball is the dark matter particle. We can't see it. But if it collides with the ball that we've set up, and actually we set up, you know, like 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 27th of them in our targets, okay? So it's like we have a huge number of, of uh, target of pool balls, okay? But if one of them suddenly moves, then we want to attribute that movement to an incoming dark matter particle. And what Tali said, the reason we go deep in a mine and the reason we build elaborate shields around these things is we don't want to be fooled by radioactivity or neutrons or something else. We want to be, or neutrinos is another one. Tali is one of the world's experts on being, being uh, confused by neutrinos, perhaps. So that's why we go deep. And it's, a, it's an awful lot of fun to go in these mines. I've, I've really gotten, uh, I've been working in them now for 10 or 15 years, and, and uh, it's a lot of fun to go a mile underground, actually. Um, great. So if, if one of your experiments is successful in, in seeing dark matter, um, Tali, in a previous conversation, you said that the next steps would be first to study that, well, to confirm that you have indeed seen dark matter with more than one experiment, then to study the dark matter particle's characteristics, and then to apply that knowledge to better understand the particle's role in the universe. I'm hoping you can explain that last bit a little bit further. Um, just how far-reaching would such a discovery be? So when we are, we get to ask these really big questions about you know, what we're made of. And uh, we know that dark matter makes about 25, 26% of the universe. We're trying to figure out what, it, what that is. And so this is the, the sort of direct detection uh, goal is to figure out what type of particle it is. But even once we know the, the, the mass of the particle, we still will need to understand a lot of other things, uh, whether it has spin, whether it has any charge, you know, all the kind of properties of the particle itself. But that's not all that there is to it. This particle has been, uh, was produced some time ago. We want to know how it was produced, when it was produced. What did that do to the universe, to the formation of the universe? So, you know, from the Big Bang to today, there's a very complicated history of what happened in the universe. And dark matter has a big role to play because dark matter is the glue that holds all of the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies and the superclusters together. So without dark matter, the universe would not look like it does today. And depending on the type of dark matter, um, that may um, change the way that structure was formed. Um, and so that's one very important thing that we would like to understand. Another thing is that today in our galaxy, we, when we're making these experiments, we don't really know what dark matter is doing. We know its density, but we don't know really 
how it's moving in the galaxy. We have some assumptions, but one thing that will be very interesting from an, astron uh, an astronomical point of view is to understand the motion of dark matter, whether it's clumpy at all, does it have structures, are there streams, is there a flat dark disk? There's all these questions about what dark matter looks like around our galaxy that also have um, uh, uh, predictions and consequences to what the uh, stars do in the galaxy. And so the, all of those things would be kind of the next steps in, in what we would love to be doing, which is dark matter astronomy at some point. Very cool. So we are running out of time, but I have one last question from a viewer that I really want to ask. Um, and this is from a viewer who identifies herself as an interested artist. So her question is, if you find dark matter, what are you going to call it? It won't be dark matter anymore. Well, I, I, mean, I, I can start with a bad idea. So it was, it was called dark matter when, when originally you looked up at, at the sky and like, well, there's things that are producing light like stars, and there are things that are clearly out there because they're gravitating, but they're not producing light, therefore they're dark. But that kind of implies that they maybe absorbed light or block light, and in fact it doesn't. See, light goes right through it. It's so you could call it clear matter, but that's dark matter at least sounds mysterious. Clear matter sounds rather boring, so well, something better than that, I hope. My comment is, is I, I hope you get people better at language than physicists, because if it's physicists who name it, we'll end up with a name like Gluon for it, and I'd prefer to have a better name than that. But since, since this uh, interested person is an artist, I, di I did look up, a, there is a sculpture by someone named Cornelia Parker, Cornelia Parker, and I, maybe it's in the Art Institute of Chicago, I'm not sure where it is, but it's called, uh, it's called Exploded Dark Matter, actually and it's inspired by, the, I think, the dark matter of the galaxy. So this idea that there's something out there that we can't sense yet is, is just a, it's one of those things that sometimes still sends, uh, you know, chills down my spine. And uh, I think I, scientists share that feeling of wonderment with artists. Uh, th this sounds like a great uh, thing to have a naming contest uh, for 20-some percent of the universe. I think we would get some much better names than what we would come up with. Wonderful. Well, whatever we call it, it will certainly be a very, very exciting discovery. Um, Harry, Gray, Tali, I wish you the best of luck in your experiments, and I'd like to thank you for joining us here today. Thank um, you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, too, to all the viewers who tuned in and asked their questions. We saw, got some great questions this week. Um, if you'd like to see this webcast again or if you want to share it with friends, it'll be available almost immediately on both the Catley Foundation website and on YouTube. And please do join us again next week for the Catley Foundation Hangout on the Science of Interstellar. That'll take place on Wednesday, November 26th at 12 p.m. Pacific. And if you want to learn about all future webcasts, please follow the Catley Foundation on Twitter. Our handle is at Catley Foundation. Thank you again for watching.